So um, I also am very fortunate because I get to think about for several months about one sermon. And Scott has to work every week and think about how to do this. But I actually knew about this when, when Scott and Lori were going to take the vacation. He asked me, he said, could you share a message that's on your heart? And um, so I actually have a, had a lot of time to think about this. And it's actually a lesson, things that have been taught to me for many, many years. And especially lately, it just keeps coming back to me. John, you need to get this. So I'm really just going to share what God's been teaching me. It's just, it's just kind of what I'm learning. And hopefully I can help you in some way by what God's teaching me. And I guess that's really my goal. So I'm going to start off with a little social media trick. It's called One Simple Trick That Can Help You. And let's start off with that. So let's just kind of work our way through how often, how great this simple trick is. And so let me scroll through. We have an advancer here. We have an advancer. <laughs> this simple trick, I know I use a small font. I apologize for that. Just forgive me on that one. This simple trick will improve your relationships. I should keep, keep, keep them flowing. It'll reduce conflict in your life. You'll be more satisfied with your life. You're going to get right with God with this simple trick. You're going to follow Jesus better with this simple trick. You're going to improve your prayer life. You're going to be a better lover. I just had to throw that out, but just to see if you're paying attention. And, then find, and so much more. It's that easy, right? It's that easy. Yes, we are live, aren't we? That's right. I got to remember that. No, I can say that. I can say that. Uh, no. First off, there's no such thing as a simple trick, right? We all know that. But what, everything else about this actually is true. This one virtue affects everything. And if we get this right, we're going to get everything else right. And it's so so critical, not just a good idea, but essential to our, our relationships to others and our relationship with God. And so if you haven't figured it out right now, the magic word is, the next one slide here, humility. Mm -hmm. Humility is that si not so simple trick. It's a, it's, a light, it's, it's, a, it's a single concept, but a lifetime lesson. And it's so important that we need to orient our minds in a new way about this incredible virtue that it will affect every, every other aspect of our life. Okay, next, next slide. What is, we want to answer the question of what is humility? And I think, I'm going to say, this guy has kind of a good idea that might help us. Anyone know who this guy is? Newton. Newton? Not close. No. Who? Galileo, close, close, Copernicus. Copernicus. That's right, he's got his little globe there. He's, got a, got the, he's rocking the dew. Yeah. And uh, he's got some papers, he looks smart. Yeah, he, and did anyone know what Copernicus was well known for? He, he helped create the heliocentric model of the solar system. And he had an issue with the, earth, the, the traditional model of how science viewed the world. And so this was the, what he had a problem with. Next slide. Oh, there it go. Thank you. I'm empowered now to, to click. Oh, it's a, okay. So it's the, it's the, uh, here we go. Oh, wrong. There we go. Okay. He had a problem. I know, I'm going so crazy. Uh, he had a problem with this, this idea, this scientific view of the world at his time. Right in the middle is the word terra. Anyone know what that means? Earth, Earth right? Terra, like territory or extraterrestrial, we get that all comes from the word terra, the Latin word for earth, right? Terra firma, very good. Um, and then you see the moon is revolving around terra, and then you have Venus. I'm not sure we have Venus is in there somewhere. And then you have the sun, and then you have all the stars. So it put, he, the, science used to think that the earth was the center of everything, and everything revolved around us. So that's what was, that was science. Don't question science. That wouldn't yeah. um, but instead, we know quite the contrary. We know we don't revolve, the sun doesn't, and the moons and the stars don't revolve around us. We actually revolve around them. And here's, this was a kind of a map, uh, it's sort of faint there, it doesn't show up very well, but kind of the idea of giving you a scale of the solar system and just how, how big a deal Earth is to the sun. We're just a tiny speck 
and, and compare it to the power of the sun, right? We get that. That's sort of like basic, you know, first grade science class, right? We're just this tiny little speck. But I would argue that this actually also has a lot to do with humility. Because when we put ourselves in the center of the universe, we're, we're proud. Pride is putting ourselves in the center of the universe. Humility is putting power and God in the center of the universe. This is, I think this is a modern definition of, 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 of pride, I think. And it puts me in the universe. And then it says, any questions? But the funny thing, it actually doesn't even ask to put a question mark on there. So it actually doesn't even want you to know. It doesn't want you to, you know, doesn't want to know your answer. It just simply just assumes. I'm the center of the universe, right? And the, there's all kinds of teachers. I, I did a search for this, for Galileo, this heliocentric model. And there's actually a lot more images of this than there are of the actual solar. I don't know. It's just kind of funny. So, but this, that's so telling. Uh, we so often think of ourselves put everything in relationship to ourselves. Something good happens to someone else? Oh, why didn't it happen to me? Something bad happens to someone else? Well, I'm glad it wasn't me. <laughs> we go see a picture on the wall. There's 40 people on there. Where am I? Right? Isn't that, don't we look for our face first in the crowd? Look at my, oh, there, there I am in the second row. I'm looking so stupid in there. And we, it might matter, but we have to find ourselves first. Or we say, well, something bad happens. Why me, God? Me, me, me. Pride, me, center, universe, me. Humility is, but humility is seeing ourselves accurately in relationship to God and others. If we're going to be humble, it's, it's gonna, this is where it starts. Putting ourselves in the right relationship to God and right, right relationship to others. And if we don't get that right, we're out of orbit. The sun is never going to revolve around us, and the moon and stars are never going to all revolve around us. Well, the moon maybe once in a while, <coughs> once a month. Um, but ultimately, it's not about me. In fact, we need to be orbiting around God and His purposes. And here's, so here's something that's been helpful to me. When do you know when you're not being humble? And I call it the three phrases of pride. And if you're saying these things out loud, or a version of these, or if you're even thinking them, you're going into a place of pride. And that's something we have to watch for. The first phrase, I deserve. Or you can even say, I don't deserve. Isn't this so often the language of our culture? I think we are, we are living in an age of, of un entitlement, unlike human history, I think, that where we think we deserve the good life. The American dream is, 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 is what we deserve. And if we don't get it, we're depressed. Oh, my, this, we didn't get that, that level of income. We didn't get that kind of relationship. And we didn't get this or that. Constant sense of entitlement where I deserve this. There is an absolute amazing narcissism in our day that brings everything back to ourselves and says it's about me. It's a psychological condition that is no longer just for, uh, in, this, in the DSM-5 uh, listed of, of abnormalities of the human condition. It's almost become a human trait in our culture that is so common that we relate everything to ourselves. I just want to get at that career level and I, that home, this isn't, I don't deserve this kind of home, I deserve that kind of home. I want, I don't know, Sid and Joanna to come and fix up my home, make me, make my house look like that. I want that amount of money in my savings account, and I need this and this. And then we often, our culture feeds it more and more, and we go on this steady progression of deserve, of things that we deserve. And we can feed it. We can even feed ourselves this entitlement. And we have to watch ourselves. When we see someone who seems so happy over there, oh, I wish I could be happy. I wish I could have that. This constant sense of desire and progression. I wish I had that kind of relationship. Oh. I wish I was had a body like that, or I was healthy. Or make, and perhaps even the, one of the most deadly is that we think we deserve heaven. I didn't do anything. I'm not Hitler. I should be in heaven. I think so many people go around thinking that just because they haven't killed anybody, they should go to heaven. They go around with this kind of standard. This sense of entitlement of what they deserve. 
God owes me an apology when I, when, for the bad things in this world. Yeah. That's the entitlement, isn't it? God, if, if God would show himself to me, then I would believe it. Entitlement. And grace, we, we, don't, we can't deserve heaven. We can't deserve a right relationship with God. We can't deserve all the good things in this world, can we? Grace, by definition, can't be deserved. We can't deserve it. We live also a place where we are so deep in comparison. What are we, first off, what are we even comparing ourselves to? Are we comparing ourselves to the 1% who are so often featured on media? Are we comparing ourselves to them? Are we comparing ourselves to the very filtered lives that often is presented on social media? Or are we comparing ourselves to the world standard? Are we comparing ourselves to the actual numbers of people who make more than $2 a day? Yeah. Are we comparing ourselves to that? Or maybe we're comparing ourselves to the US standard? What are we comparing ourselves? <laughs> comparing ourselves to the historical standard? What are we comparing ourselves? We have to ask that question. Comparison is the cancer of joy. It destroys the joy and thankful hearts that God wants us to have because we feed ourselves with our entitlements. The I deserve robs us of happiness, peace, thankfulness, and generosity. I think it's even a cause of many forms of depression. I don't want to make big assumptions for all depression, but so often it can feed into a depression. <laughs> An overwhelming self-focus about what I should have gotten. I wish I had parents that were different. Or I wish I had this or that. And it just fosters an anger and bitterness. Greed, envy, gluttony, all can flow from a sense of entitlement of what we deserve. And so when this word, when we start hearing this in our brains, watch out. We're not going towards the road of humility. We're going towards the road of pride. Where did I point? Up there? Okay. And the second phrase of pride is greater than. Greater than puts ourselves in comparison to other people, right? And then we see ourselves as greater than them. Wherever, and this could be, it's absolutely amazing how broadly we can use this, this, this concept. How often we can put ourselves as greater than someone else. In fact, it's almost limitless. I actually was at a place that I was in a, in a utterly poor village in India, and this guy was living in a mud hut, and he was he took us in as, as guests and he was cooking for us, and then we asked him about some of the other people in the neighborhood who were had just not quite as nice mud huts, and he was saying, "Oh, we have nothing to do with them. They're in a lower caste." In fact, if they walked into our house, we'd have to burn everything that they touched. And I'm like, this guy is, in his poverty, he still sees himself as so far superior to the man right across the street. He had a category. But let's not put that over, over on the other side of the world, right? Let's, put, let's look at ourselves. In fact, anything good that we see about ourselves can be a place of superiority. Oh, did I reverse this? I'm sorry about that. Uh -huh. Great amount. See, I don't know. I, a lot I don't do right. Um, any place of success, whether it's financial, social, physical, material, even spiritual success, is a place of of pride. It's when we can start to be tempted to think that we could be greater than someone else. And there's so many ways this could look. If, and so if you think, oh, I've I'm in good financial standing. Therefore, we can view ourselves in a place of superiority or someone who's poor. And we then can, then can become accusatory and, and, and accusing them. Or maybe we're in good shape. Then we could accuse somebody who's not. Maybe we, we have a good family. Well, they, we, well, we spend time with our kids. They don't. Oh, they just throw their kids in front of the television or iPad. We read to our kids, you know, so therefore we're better. It's endless. Endless ways we can put ourselves in a place of superiority. But I'm going to focus on two of them. One is intellectual superiority. When, when we see ourselves as more intelligent, we've got it figured out. We just, we just get it. When we see ourselves that way, we're in great danger. Better, and when we start seeing ourselves in our opinions as better than other people, we have, then, we, then when, when we're like that, what do we do? We talk. We don't listen. 
or we, we quickly disregard because we know better. Or we've got that guy all figured out. Or we've got those people all figured out. That's what they're up to. We get to so much danger when we have intellectual superiority. And we start thinking that everyone else is an idiot. We think everyone, oh, those, those idiots in Washington, they don't know what they're doing. Oh, those idiots in Hollywood, throwing all that sleaze in us. Oh, those libtards. Oh, those conservative <laughs> racists. Whatever, I don't know. <laughs> Come on, you know you heard that this week. You know you did. 30 seconds, right? I got 30 seconds? <laughs> the point is, we can so often judge them, and we don't understand our, uh, we oftentimes don't look at them. We view ourselves as superior. I met a man two weeks ago. He's leading the Islamic Forum for Democracy. And uh, he's a, a local guy, and he's trying to bring a reformation to Islam. He has death threats. He's a, he's, this guy was a hero. This guy's risking his life to help and bring freedom and new openness to Islam. And he feels there's so much good in Islam that we can bring, but it's oppressed by the majority. But he also he said, we want a reformation. And I, he, he used that word intentionally. Because we have to look at the reformation that we went through in our culture. Do you know how bad, what, how many wars were fought over the Reformation? Do you know how many millions of Europeans killed each other? Lutherans, Calvinists, and Catholics killing each other? Millions. Anywhere from 3 to 15 million people over the course of 50 years were killed for their theological beliefs in order to enforce it over the other people. The whole, a third of Germany was killed over the course of 30 years. Whole villages wiped out, mass rape. Go figure on that. Great theology, huh? Killing and horror over theology. And so they had to go through a, a horrible period in order to achieve kind of what modern Europe ultimately became. A lot more democratic, a lot more, a lot higher educated. But we had ugly periods in our history. And so we have to be humble to, before we accuse other people that we have to look at our own sin. And our own, or maybe we don't have all the answers either, or we had to go through certain things. So we have to be careful when we, we think we have everyone figured out, and that our view of ourselves is, is, is so much more superior, and we think we're better. So intellectual superiority. The second is moral superiority. And this actually is one of the largest themes of the ministry of Jesus. Moral superiority says... My upbringing, not just my intellect, but my moral abilities, my abstention, the way I, I don't do that sin. Oh, I'm, I'm not homosexual. Oh, I wouldn't do that. You know, and so we think we're self are, are better. Or I don't do those kind of drugs, but I do, you know, I, mean, I do the legal ones, just not the illegal ones. Or whatever that might be. And we, we view our greatness and superiority as the result of our morality. And we become judges rather than saying, but by the grace of God, therefore go I. If it isn't for God's grace, we're no different. Or maybe we just sin differently. And we can pick and choose so often to focus on a few sins and ignore our own. And ignore that I'm just as bad. You know, I've, I've spent a lot of time um, in the last three months visiting different homeless ministries. And, work, and seeing some of these people coming right off the streets. And just about, I, I was aware that every presentation from about seven of these different ministries included the fact that most people judge the homeless for their sin, and that's it's their fault. We blame them the, as, across the board. They're homeless because they didn't manage their finances, they got addicted to drugs, or they screwed up of people, and they screwed up their relationships. And they said that's the number one thing we have to get, uh, get people to get through, that maybe the people on our streets aren't always just, it isn't the result just of their sin. Maybe we don't have to, we can't, don't have to judge them. So we have to be careful that we put ourselves in a morally superior position because that's the, that's the position of the Pharisees. Jesus didn't attack, come, come and, and spent three years in his ministry attacking the Roman government for their oppressive uh, domination over Israel. Did he spend his, I don't see a lot of that, did he? I don't see his oppressive moral uh, condemnation of all those sinners, those uh, prostitutes and tax collectors that are corrupting our kids' morals. His primary point of conflict 
was the, was with the Pharisees, with the religious, those people who put themselves in a morally superior position and who should have known better because they spent the most time studying the scriptures. So this is so we have to be careful that we never see ourselves as above someone morally or intellectually or in any other way. We can come to people as equals. We can we can join with them. The only thing that should cause us not to associate with someone is that if they drag us into a certain sin. Not if they're a sinner, but if they, they willfully drag us into certain sin. Then I think we can distance ourselves for a period of time until we're no longer until we're able to you know, not, not be that kind of person who gets dragged in. But beyond that, we should be able to associate with anyone, no matter what, what their status. We look at one sin we might not struggle with and judge others but at the same time ignore the sins of our life. We need to be aware and go into the cross and say, Lord, reveal the sin in me. Show me where I am judgmental or I am superior. And then I gave it away for the third phrase of pride is, I got this. And this is this attitude of being in control. I got it. It's all, it's all good. I'm, I'm in charge. I'm, and this can be both overconfidence, like, I'm gonna, I, can, I can do whatever I want. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to charge my own destiny. And this is so common in our culture. We're telling everyone, follow your dreams. Do every, you can do it. You can achieve every, all your wildest dreams. All you, everyone in this room, we can all win the Super Bowl, right? You just follow your dreams, right? Believe in yourself. Now, that's not completely, totally wrong, right? It's not, it's not wrong to have some confidence. But it's, it's an overconfidence, the feeling that you never need God and you never need other people. But, uh, but when you control, you can also control in different ways. You can actually be a control by fear and not do anything. I want to just can keep, I want to just stay here and be safe and just control my nice little world and just keep every, all the bad things out of it and just stay in control. Even fearful in action can be just as bad and can be just as the sense of self-confidence and the wrong kind of confidence that says, I got this. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord, trust in the Lord with all your heart, not in yourself. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. So instead of these three, I'm going to go uh, give you some alternatives. So instead of I deserve, we should say God deserves and I serve. That's a, what a humble person says. God deserves the glory. God deserves the credit. And I, sh I will serve and honor that. I will serve other people. So a humble person seeks to serve and, get, and make sure that God gets the glory and the credit. Second, God's, instead of I got this, God's got this. God's in control. And we need each other. There's no such thing as an independent Christian. You can't just do it on your own. And if you're watching from home, connect. Connect with other humans and and spend time with them. We need each other. We need each other. God, God's got it, and we need each other. And instead of greater than other people, I am I, to be in, in, hum, in my, the right position of humility, I need to know that I'm always less than God. He always knows better. And I'm no greater than anybody else. So the humble person says, God deserves, I serve. God's got this, we need each other. And I am less than God, and no greater than anyone else. So now, what humility is not? And I think it's important when you so emphasize humility that you consider uh, what it isn't. And the first is false humility. You know, that's pretty obvious, right? Humility isn't false humility. That's sort of self-proving. But false humility is you use the words of humility, but in actuality, you're still in the center and it's still all about you. You can actually brag about how bad your life is, and it's still all about you. And, put, and it's all, everything's back in relationship to you. You think, oh, you had two wisdom teeth pulled? And that's nothing, I had four wisdom teeth pulled. <laughs> I really suffered. You just took out the, you know, there was no compassion, it's like, nothing. Hey, I'm, you know I'm quoting, no, okay, I'm quoting a stand-up comedian on that one, so. Um, so we, we top everyone's suffering by how much, how much more we suffer. So humil false humility is still keeping ourselves at the center of the universe. 
but using the language of humility. And the next one I call worm theology. Anyone studied worm theology? <laughs> worm theology? Well, there probably wasn't a book on it. Probably wouldn't be a bestseller. But it's surprising uh, often in certain church circles, and I'm sorry if you spent a lot of time in this, but it's the way that the only response of our obedience to God is to know how unbelievably wretched and awful we are. And that's it. It's all it, that's, the whole goal is to know just how bad and awful we are. Now, we absolutely need to know that we are a sinner. That we know there was nothing righteous in us. I don't disagree with that. That's good theology. But that's not where we end up. No. Because we cannot just... Warm theology leaves you there. It doesn't lift you out. Warm theology doesn't, needs to understand... I mean, if you have that, forget that. Understand that... Warm, uh, what, I want you to know that you are loved by God. This is good theology. You are loved by God. God has put His Spirit within you. That's not a worm. That's not a worthless throwaway person. God has put His Spirit within His people to do divine work. He has given you things to say. You actually have a voice. Some people think they're being humble by being silent. Or they're, they're, they're just hold, or they're always not, they're ne they never speak up. God has given you a voice and things to say. I just was listening to a pastor down in Tucson, and he had a list. He was leading a large church down there, and he, he could have easily said, well, I have a speech impediment. I don't think I'm the right guy to talk. And he, he had a, a list and a, and a stutter. And, he, and God was using him mightily to bless other people. And so he has given you things to say. So just being silent isn't being humble. So, and also sometimes it means you need to say no. Jesus sometimes said no to the crowds who wanted him to ask. Some, some people, we get, we get doormats. And we let other people control us rather than what God wants us to do. We, worm theology would, uh, would want you just to be a doormat. Be controlled. But we... He has given you things to say. He has gifted you through His Spirit. Not only is the Spirit within you, his, his Spirit has given you gifts. And we need to use those. Whatever it is, whether it's teaching or service or whatever, when God has, comes into your life and grants you a spiritual gift, it's meant to be used. You're meant to use that for His glory. And He's given you natural gifts. You're born with things that God put in you from your birth, from your from your upbringing, from your, from your parents that, that, that instilled it into you. He's given you natural gifts that need to be used for his glory. The classic, when I run, I feel his pleasure. This is the idea that what he was running, you knew he was gifted to run. And if you're gifted in that way, you need to use it. And use it for the glory of God. And enjoy, it's okay to enjoy things that God gives you. And he's given us material things that we're to enjoy. God loves to bless his people. He can withhold them to teach us things, and he can bless us so to, 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 for us to enjoy as well. He, and so we can enjoy those things and have a, a great joy in the Lord because knowing that we are loved by God and his spirit is within us, we have things to say, his, he's gifted me through naturally, spiritually, materially, and he's given me purpose. You've been given a divine purpose to do the work of God. I mean, how awesome is that? What a great job description that is. <laughs> and finally, humility is not abuse. And I think it's worth mentioning um, that Christ willfully submitted at, at a time in his life to ex accepting abuse on his life. He chose that. And he willfully endured suffering for a greater good for the cause. And he didn't want to. And he pleaded for God to take it away. But he willfully endured it for the sake of the cross. But he was never out of control. And I encourage you to get out of any kind of abusive relationship that is, that is keeping you from being, uh, destroying you from being the person God wants you to be. Talk with someone. Don't, be, don't, be, don't think that being humble is being abused. Just saying this as a pastor, because I care. Don't let that happen. Talk to someone. We're here. So why humility matters. Humility matters because basically it's the basis for all virtue. And, you know, that sounds fancy, but all good human attributes will ultimately flow out of humility. 
We know the seven deadly sins, right? And we've, we've, I guess we don't study them that much anymore, but from hundreds of years of human history, that was the idea of moral teaching. And we, you know, pride, greed, gluttony, envy, sloth, uh, anger. I think there's, there's might have been one more. One more. Um, but the pride is always considered the deadliest. And all of them have their root in pride. So if pride is the root of sin, of all the deadly sin, then humility is the root of all virtue. So if pride is the root of all sin, then humility is the root of all virtue. Humility is essential for true love. We all want it. We want to be, we want to be loved, and we want to be able to give love. We want, to, we want a world with more love in it. And it simply isn't going to happen with a lot of proud people. It's going to be a lot of people who want to serve and help others, and not make it all about themselves and, and, and love other people. Love is, humility has to happen before love can bloom. Now, I used to think that the greatest virtue of all, of, of all was love, and I think it's the greatest expression of our Christian life. Love of God, love of others, right? But that can't even happen without humility. Because when we think we deserve and we think we're greater than other people, we never will truly love them. We'll use them will consume them for us, but we'll never love and give to them. If it's all about you, the other person will eventually burn out. I call that mosquito love. When you use that person to give them, get what you need. It's also essential for compassion. You need to have compassion. If you don't have compassion for other people, because you, you think you're better than them, then you're not going to you're not going to be able to, to care. You simply don't care if, you have, if, you, if you're not humble. And then hum humility is the first step to heal our land. The scripture says, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Actually, I didn't write this one. I didn't bring, could someone just read that for me or knows it by memory? 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and confess their turn, 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 seek, my, seek my face. Yeah. Seek my face. Turn, turn from their wicked ways. I will, I will heal their land. Yeah. That's right. It's a classic, it's a very well-known verse, and I think it's often overlooked that the very first thing asked of God's people, not Americans, not of other countries, of God's people, is, the, is to humble themselves. We have a responsibility to seek to humble ourselves. The first step for the healing of our land, the healing of our country, will be the humility of God's people. We want to make America great? Humble ourselves. Do, do we even care? Is, is America the center of the universe? No. Putting America in the middle of me in, instead of me is no different. But we're not. We want to humble ourselves and serve. And not, put our, not put just us and our nation in the center of everything. We can be, a great, we can be great citizens. I mean, I work for the government. I want, to serve my, I want to serve my state. I want to serve my country. But it, doesn't put, it still doesn't change the fact that God is the center. <clears throat> and ultimately, humility is central for a relationship with God. I want to read, I also gave out some scripture readings. So if you have a little slip, if you could just read that for me. Why don't you start? Um, 2 Samuel 22. You save the humble, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them low. Okay. Okay. So, <clears throat> Psalm 18, uh, 27. You save the humble, but bring low those whose eyes are haughty. James 4.10, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Proverbs 3.34, he mocks proud mockers, but gives grace to the humble. James 4.6, but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Okay, good. This is a huge theme throughout Scripture. The difference between what is God, where is God, for, who's He for, who's He against, and then you have it. Pri the proud, He's against. He's for the humble. God is looking for humble people to be used by Him. So it's central for a relationship with God, and it's the basis for a life of divine power. And finally, humility matters because Jesus and the gospel ultimately become irrelevant if we aren't humble. Have you thought about that? Even the gospel itself requires humility. 
What is the gospel? Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 1, 1 through 4. He summarizes in four words. This man, Jesus, was the Christ, our Savior, who died for our sins and saves us. That Jesus Christ is our Lord. He's in control. He's in charge, not ourselves. That's the gospel in a nutshell. Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so you can't have a Savior if you're proud. You can't have a Lord when you're in charge, when it's all about you. So really, there's not even a gospel for you if you're full of yourself. And when, when we're proud, there's no gospel. It simply does, it won't work because you haven't embraced it. You haven't embraced it. You actually, I need a savior. I'm a sinner. I really don't have it figured out. I make so many bad decisions. I tend to go the wrong way. I need a different Lord and not myself. So the, as we, one, one person read, and I'm just, I want to help us out little, just practically to kind of help bring this home and how to foster humility, and we'll wrap it up. I hope I haven't gone on too long. But just to be help, give us something practical to work with. Oftentimes, it, the scripture asks us, or tells us, and commands us to humble ourselves. So we have a responsibility to do something. So the first is, let's try serve the needy. Serving has a great way of humbling ourselves. It, 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 it's, it's almost magical way it works. But unless we think we're out to get credit or just make ourselves feel good. But when you really get in, not just random acts of kindness, but really serving needs, get into, get into involved with a messy marriage and talk, help, help work through that or help, help difficult children or help people who are really st stuck in addiction. You'll find it's, it's messy and it's hard and it's, and there's, it's not easy, but it humbles us because we realize we can't control everything, but we can love and serve. Serving is a great way to foster humility. Be open to criticism. The last three times someone has said something critical of you, how did you respond? How did you, what did you say? What? Did, thank, thank you? No, that is awesome. That's really what we should say, or at least consider it. So oftentimes we dismiss it, doesn't fit with my deal, it's not me, I, I, you know, it doesn't fit with our, our self idea of awesomeness, so that criticism doesn't fit. So I've seen some amazing godly people who didn't accept criticism. So, but yeah, so open, open to criticism. You're going to say something? Defense. Being, De defense. being defensive, we go right back at them. We point out their hypocrisy. <laughs> oh dear, you know. Or either so, or, or what, whatever it might be. Rarely do we think, or we should at least consider. We don't. We aren't defined by our critics. But we are foolish to ignore them. So we need to be open to criticism. Am I open? Here's another way to get humble. Try, try breaking a habit. Anyone broken a, 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 a habit this year? It's not easy. It should humble us when we see that we, we're actually really resistant to change. And maybe we don't have it figured out. We don't even have our, ourselves mastered. You know, if we can't master certain things, how can we master others and have it all figured out? Try changing habit and see how awesome we are. Uh, then also confess your sin to someone. James commands us to confess our sins to one another. And be specific. Oh, I'm just a sinner saved by God's grace. That's really easy to say in one, in, for many of us. But being specific, oh, that's a little, I don't know. I don't know about that one. Confessing your sin keeps us humble and reminds us that we need others to give us grace and we need God to give us grace. Also, seek forgiveness of someone. If you've wronged anyone, yeah, a proud person is not worried about it. But if you're humble, you're willing to admit you've, gone, you've done wrong and ask that person for forgiveness if you've, if you've sinned against them. Then think about others, pray for them, listen to them, spend your money on them. A lot of times our thoughts and our prayers and how we spend our money, it all comes down to us. Maybe God didn't give us our salary to be only used on ourselves. Maybe it's a, a portion of it is for us. Maybe it's meant to help those around us. <clears throat> I still remember Melissa and I were a couple, um, couple years ago, we were trying to, starting to dream again after a, couple, a rough year. And we we're asking, writing the Lord, you know, saying, well, how, do we, how can we dream again? What could be... What could be something that we could dream about again? And, um, and Melissa blew me away. She goes, well, what, how can, not only about our dreams, how can we help other people achieve their dreams? 
that's awesome. In a culture that says follow your dreams, we can be asking, what are you, God, what do you want for someone else's life and how can we help them achieve it? So remember that, honey. Amazing. Um, that's another one. And then um, do everything you possibly can to make sure God remains in the center. Everything. Just how, make sure, am I orienting everything to making God? It's about God. I was at a funeral yesterday of a, of a dear friend, um, and he was uh, in his uh, early 70s and lived a full life. And I'll tell you, this was a happy funeral. I mean, you go to their sad funerals, but this was a happy one because this was a man who lived serving other people. And there was, yeah, there, there were some good things said about the guy, but ultimately, that it was really about what God had done and how God had used his, his life for his glory. And boy, wasn't that great? What, what if we lived for the elegy rather than the resume? With the, for the eulogy rather than for what people will say at our funeral rather than what looks good to an employer? What if we got that weight when that people were saying, wow, God, he was faithful to the Lord. Well done and good, my faithful servant. And people were praising the Lord, not him. Make sure God remains at the center. And finally, I guess there was one I didn't put on there. Pray for humility. I don't, honestly, that's a hard prayer. I don't pray for it very much. God has graciously given me humility and continues to humble me. But pray for it. Ask, Lord, humble me if I'm so full of myself. Make me think less. Make me think more of you. Less of me, more of you. Just going to close with just an example. Um, about two years ago, um, we were in a financial crisis. And it, it, was, it was a very difficult time. And there was a point where it's like, Lord, we do not have enough money. We need about, we need help. And I remember practically crying, asking the Lord for this uh, request. And so I'm just going to keep it real here, okay? So, um, and I remember just so, uh, so I remember within 30 minutes, I went over and we had found a little bed bug in our house. And I looked and I was like, you're kidding me. And we had it sent in and found out that that was going to be about $5,000 to get our house properly fumigated for the, to deal with the bed bugs. And I said, Lord, <laughs> I just prayed for financial for help, and this is what I get. I'm your, you know, I'm trying to be a pastor and serve you, but you know, it just didn't feel fair. And I realized something, and I and I'm just kind of figured out this out this year because I kind of stung for a while. The Lord would do that, and I don't think I fully understood at the time. And two things happened. In October, I went to a. Uh, um, a, a, a conference that was dealing with poverty and we did the simulation where you had to be a, 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 a poor person for about a month and what it was like and you had fake money and you had to make it through the month and it was very very difficult you had there's about 60 of us in this room going through these different booths and figuring things out and at the very end I ended up losing and, I, and they're all based on real people real situations at the very end I had, had locked my car had broken down. I didn't have any money to fix it. I pawned off my stuff so I could stay on my meds. And then I ended up losing I, the ability to pay rent. And so I ended up in a homeless shelter in my little simulation. And, and then I'm, so I'm just sort of pretending near we're all kind of, kind of laughing around. And then the, the lady who was playing the part of the homeless shelter attendant comes up and gives me a random sticker and it put, it put bed bugs on it. Uh. To know what it was like to be homeless in a homeless shelter. I cried because I, I, I felt that pain that I never would have cared about. I wouldn't have even thought it would have been kind of funny unless it had happened to me. And that, humi that humility that I had been given from the Lord from that, my desperate prayer was, was better than the, the $5,000 because yeah. I actually started to care about the, the, the person that could be sitting in a homeless shelter. And I realized that the prayers that had been, had been answered they were, they were prayers that God was giving us of, of humbling me so that I could care more and give more of myself. So, I don't know what else I have to say, but I just have to share that with you. But um, this, is, this is a personal issue for me. It's the a, it's a real deal, and God's still working on me. But I just want to share what God's been teaching me. Thank you all for listening. And let's just, if I can just pray for us.